good morning. Thank you all for coming out this morning. I think we've got pretty much everybody in here now. Uh, thank you for coming out this morning. We're excited to have you all here. What a great turnout we had this morning for our Cars and Coffee event. Beautiful, beautiful morning out. Uh, we're all honored to have Brian Strauss with us today to be our guest speaker. Those of you who have come to some of our other TRED Talks have met Brian in the past. He always does an amazing job for us. Brian is retired from American Institute of Baking after 28 years, retired in 2018. Now he uh, has a self-employed uh, consulting business in the baking industry. He's married to Lori. They have two sons, a daughter, and four grandchildren. And uh, shortly after retirement, Brian came on as one of our volunteers at the museum and has since uh, uh, also became a member of our session advisory board. That board meets with me monthly to talk about cars, not only that we will have on loan at the museum, but cars that we're thinking about purchasing or cars that we need to think about purchasing. I just want to thank Brian for serving on that. Brian's going to talk to us about George Barris today, and I'm not going to take up any more of his time, so thank you, Brian. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I've got a couple of other talks, um, and I've got a tough act to follow. I didn't know Anna was going to show up today. She's a, she did a great talk last month on the Cord Sportsman, if you didn't see that. She actually kind of gave me a little bit of a lead-in in a couple of different ways. Um, one of her last slides talked about how the, a concept of the cord was maybe a really early version of the Batmobile, so keep that in mind, kind of a spoiler alert there, but there's certainly a tie-in there across cars. Um, she also did a little snappier job addressing to the period than, than I am this morning, but I'm, I'm hoping to make up for that in a little bit here. So it's my pleasure to, to talk about this when uh, we talk about the tread talks that we want to do every month, um, we try to plan about a year ahead. We're already planning for, for next year. Um, Doug said, hey, how about if we talk about George Barris? And I'll be honest with you, I knew who George Barris was and I knew some things about him, um, but it was a great opportunity to put this talk together and, and I'm sure Ann will vouch for this. You learn so much yourself when you start going through all the books and online references and it just becomes a giant rabbit hole. I finally had to stop what I was putting together here um, and then pair it back. So I had a lot of fun putting this together and we're gonna talk about several things. So my old uh, instructor comes out here. There we go. Uh, I got a little outline here. We're gonna talk about um, why I identify with George Bear's cars because there is kind of a connection and if you heard me talk about the Superbird or the DeLorean in the past, you're gonna kind of understand where I'm coming from there already. Uh, we'll talk about who exactly was George Barris. He has a very interesting history and background just to understand who he was and how he got into doing what he did. Um, there are some cars that brought him to fame. We're going to talk about those. And then we're going to finish up this morning talking about what cars do we have here in the uh, Dream Car Collection. This is a giveaway. The Sunny and Share cars are going to be one that we're talking about. We've got two other cars in the collection um, that relate to George Barris creations, and so we're going to talk about that too. So let's start off. Why do I identify with George Barris? Well, keep in mind that could, there could be some movie or TV trivia coming along because that's definitely my connection to him. So although I didn't dress up this morning, I have been known to do that in the past. This was me last October at the Halloween party dressed up as Herman Munster next to the Dragula car that we'll talk about later on. So I had a lot of fun figuring out how to look exactly like that and I will tell you it was impossible to see out of that mask. They put me at the front door handing out cars to kids because that's about as much as I could negotiate from a visual standpoint. But uh, So I really love uh, the t connection to uh, TV shows like the Dragula car has and we will like I said, get around to talking about that. So George Barris, um, originally named George Salapatis from a Greek family, um, grew up in the Chicago area, born in 1925, had another brother, Sam, that we'll talk about. Um, he and Sam moved from Chicago to Roseville, California, which is in the Sacramento area, so kind of mid-state California. When he was um, three years old, after the death of their mother, so they, he, the dad sent him to California to live with an uncle, an aunt, and some extended family that was, was out there. By age seven, George and presumably Sam, because they did a lot of things together, uh, were building a lot of model cars, and back in the day, 
Uh, plastic cars as built as models were one thing. A lot of things were built out of balsa wood. So he was cutting out models from balsa wood, doing heavy modifications as a seven-year-old, and then entering these modified cars into hobby store contests so that he could win some contests there. So he got a really early start modifying cars. They were just model cars to begin with. Um, once he got a little bit older, and he was working in this Greek restaurant that was in that Sacramento area where he and his brother Sam were living. Um, they gave him a 1925 Buick for helping in that restaurant and they immediately started to modify that car. So this is really the first full-size car that he and his brother Sam started to modify while they were in high school. Got a group of guys together, I think you can kind of imagine um, early 50s, early 60s, a lot of guys kind of revolved around that car culture and that's what they did after school. They went to somebody's garage, they worked on a car, they spent all weekend working on cars. And so he formed a club that he called the Customs Car Club. And if you're familiar with George Barris, um, he continued to use through his career that K in the spelling of custom. And this is really started when he was back in high school with his brother. Continued that through his entire career. Um, when he was 18 and had graduated from high school, he moved to the LA area. Big growing car culture out there, mid 50s, late 50s, and he wanted to become a part of that and he opened the Barris Custom Shop along with George. Um, George enlisted in the Navy in World War II, went off and, and served his term there, and then came back. But they started very early building this reputation of building custom cars for local celebrities. Um, they also built some race cars and raced them on their own, so they got some press that way as well. And this was really one of the first cars that George did that uh, kind of got him recognized. So through this presentation, I've tried to do the best job I could of finding pictures of what the original, not the literal car, but the model of car that he customized looked like to try to give you an idea of where did he start and then how did it end up uh, with the vision that he applied to it. So the very first thing that he did was a 1947 Hudson Super 6 convertible that started off looking something like this. And he modified it into something that looked like that in 1952. Got a lot of attention in the local area, um, rightly so, because that's a pretty big makeover and that is the literal car that he did. Um, and you can see that the, some of the modifying techniques that he used of exaggerating the fenders, chopping the roof, although in this case it was a convertible, he actually put a roof on it, but chopped, um, really started to set his style apart. And it also kind of indicated, or led to the trend of a lot of people looking at those early Buicks as something to modify. So it really kind of started with him when you think about the number of people that took Buicks and then modified them out. So that started to get the attention of a, a lot of people out in the LA area. Pretty soon he was making uh, cars for executives. He started to make some cars that went into the movies. Uh, the first one that he's generally credited with is a 1958 movie called High School Confidential that he modified some cars for that particular movie. Um, one other thing that actually shows up a little bit earlier than that is if you're a, um, an Alfred Hitchcock fan, you probably know the movie North by Northwest. Cary Grant goes off, big road trip, journey, a lot of peril in uh, North by Northwest. It's a little bit of an obscure scene, but there's a scene where a police car rear ends a really expensive Mercedes, if you know that movie. And one of the first things that, that George really did as a movie credit was he modified the fenders on the front of that police car to be made out of aluminum. So that when it hit that really expensive Mercedes, it did very little damage to the Mercedes, but it crumpled that police car um, front end. I pulled up some pictures trying to see if I could find a good one of that, which I could not, but it was apparent that the other thing that they did was they put a very extended substantial rear bumper on that Mercedes as well. So they kind of uh, kind of played the cards to uh, crumple that police car, but that was one of the really first things that I could find that he did. But this, uh, this first movie definitely got him the attention of a lot of people, including a guy named Robert Peterson, that now we know Peterson from the Peterson Auto Museum, but back in the early day, he was a publisher of those car magazines, 
hot rod and motor trend. And that relationship with Peterson got a lot of press for Barris and the cars that he was modifying. At one point, he even wrote columns on how to modify in some of those early car magazines. So that really led him on to uh, quite a few different cars in the movies. Again, if you know the old movie H.G. Wells, The Time Machine, like the early 50s version of that, there, were, there was a segment in that movie where there's future. He goes into the future with his time machine and Barris did several of those cars that were future cars. So a lot of different connections there. About the same time, his brother Sam, who was uh, part of the business with him early on, was working with George but also doing his own thing. And it really helped to build the reputation of the brothers and of their company as a customizer. This is one of the first things that Sam did. He, uh, 19, 1951 Mercury Coupe that he actually customized for himself to start with. This guy named Hirohata saw one and had him basically make himself one. And this Hirohata Merc did the tour, including the 1952 General Motors Motorama. And it got so much attention at that show that it actually outshined a lot of the new models that were coming out from General Motors. So that helped as well to kind of build their reputation. Brother Sam also built um, this particular uh, Model T truck that is called uh, a la carte. And this one went on to win uh, consecutive um, consecutive uh, America's Most Beautiful Roadster competitions two years in a row with this same truck. This truck also shows up in some movies, mostly in background shots, um, but again shows how they really were starting to develop their custom style fender flares, open engine bays, uh, kind of crazy paint, uh, modifying the roof lines, um, and especially wheels too. Wheels were a big part, and we're going to talk about that when we get to to the Mustangs as well. So there were a lot of things um, that the two of them did together that really helped to set that early style. In the 1950s, um, Sam left the business. Not even sure what he did, but he left the business. He also died pretty early. He was only like 42 when he passed away. So um, he wasn't around very long. And George stayed in the business and really brought his wife in to more of a promotional uh, position with it and he customizes it he he credits his wife Shirley as really helping the business to grow to what it was as a customizing business so a lot of people especially some people my age um, boomers built a lot of model cars anybody build some model cars as a kid that was part of the other success of George Barris was he got in with Ravel and AMT and all the model car makers and so a lot of these cars that he did and cars that he just designed became car models. And that was a big part of what really got his name out there um, as well. There were a lot of, he wasn't the only guy, there was a lot of guys out there and this was part of the difficulty in trying to sort through what did George Barris really do and what did the guys that work for him really do and what did the competition for him really do. It got to be a little murky. I mentioned this to Aiden this morning that sometimes I had trouble pulling out exactly what was the true detail um, of who did what. Um, Aiden said we're probably gonna get a lot of negative comments on the YouTube feed when we put this out there. They're like, that guy didn't know what he was talking about. Well, that could be, but I was trying to do the best I could, but it got really super murky as to um, who was doing exactly what. But there are some things that um, are very clearly George Barris. And the best example is probably this one right here. This is a um, Ford Futura that was developed um, in 1955 to run the show circuit with um, Lincoln as a concept car. It was designed and built in Italy by some Italian designers and it was uh, very popular when it when it went around through the shows and it was one of these styling cars and if you've uh, seen the manta ray out there that kind of gives you an indication of how outrageous people used to make cars just to kind of push the envelope on what did people really want to see in a car this was developed 
at the time, 1955, at a cost of approximately $250,000, which by today's dollars, about two and a half million to develop a concept car. I don't know if that's cheap or expensive with what they do today to develop concept cars, but a, good, a pretty good piece of money um, at that particular time. So um, it ran the circuit, kind of fell away, and showed back up a few years later as this car. 1959 makes its uh, debut in a movie called Started With a Kiss, starring Debbie Reynolds and Glenn Ford. I'm a big movie fan, I've never seen that one. So uh, keep that in mind if you're looking for it. The original was white, the, uh, the previous picture was black and white, but it was painted originally a pearl white, which I'm sure was really beautiful, but it didn't show well on film. So they painted it red into this configuration uh, so that it photographed better in the movie. It also shows up in this red painted version in a Ford promotional film called The Secret Door that shows what went on behind the scene in Ford's styling center. So makes a couple of, uh, of uh, uh, shows up in a couple of different ways at the auto shows and then in this movie. And then it kind of disappears for a while because Ford couldn't license it. It wasn't a really a drivable car. They didn't think didn't really know what to do with that, I don't think. George Barris was making a name for himself at this point in the late 50s, early 60s, so they sold it to George Barris for a dollar. And other considerations in the future was kind of the way the contract read. So George Barris had this car, and he had it parked in back of his shop, and it was kind of just starting to deteriorate away as it sat there unused and not really doing anything. But, uh, but then something happened, and you can probably all guess where this is going, right? Are you all with me? Right, it becomes the original Batman car. Um, so even that is uh, kind of a lucky coincidence, because originally ABC was developing this show, the original Batman, um, Adam West playing Batman. He's the real Batman, I don't care what you say. Yeah. Um, and so ABC was developing this series, which was apparently on a pretty fast track. And so they originally went to a designer named, I'm going to look this up so I get this right, Dean Jeffries. And Dean Jeffries was one of those guys that was customizing cars out in Southern California, right there alongside George Barris. They went to him and Jeffries started designing a Batmobile. I don't think he got to the point that he was building it. And for some reason, ABC moved the timeline up. And Jeffrey said, I can't, I can't do it that fast. You know, go find somebody else. So the powers that be went to Barris, and Barris said, well, I, I think I got something that I can use. So he had the advantage that he had this Futura body sitting in back of his shop. He pulled this out, and his, um, he designed it, but his builder, a guy named Bill Cushenberry, actually did most of the build. And they took, see, they took the car from this, to this in three weeks and turn it over to ABC for the 1966 um, series um, Batman. So pretty quick. So it was obviously an advantage that he had something that was a, a pretty good base to work with. Um, as, who knows what Jeffries was coming up with. I, I couldn't find any references to that. So this is, to the best of my knowledge, uh, a picture of the original Batmobile. This is one of the things that gets kind of sketchy about, well, what one's original? Because Barris actually built six of these himself afterwards. Now, obviously, only the very first one was built off of the Futura. He built other ones off of a Ford Galaxy um, body and frame. But this is, as I said, to the best of my knowledge, a picture of the original Batmobile from the series. And this is part of where the story gets a little murky again. Barris had it for many, many years. He sold it in 2013 in a Barrett Jackson, Barrett Jackson auction in Arizona to a businessman there in Arizona that the, uh, the hammered price was $4.62 million in 2013 for the original Batmobile. I could find a reference that it sold again in 2016 on an online auction site that among other things sold um, uh, Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch, uh, sold a lot of other really expensive cars and some other uh, super obscure things. I couldn't find a price, 
but, and it, but it seems to have changed hands from this guy named Champagne that owned it uh, from 2013 to 2016. So it's out there someplace, but I'm not exactly sure where. But it does seem to be the original, original um, Batmobile. So these next few slides, um, what I want to do again is show some before and after cars that um, George Barris built. And we'll see if we can have a little fun along the way. So here we have, whoop, sorry, a 1921 Oldsmobile 43A Touring. That's what George started with. Anybody want to guess what that one became? Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is a good guess. The Beverly Hillbillies car. So that's what he started with and turned it into that. And again, I'm a big, I grew up watching TV. Sorry, Dad, my dad's up here in the second row. I grew up watching TV. Um, and I think I've seen every episode of Beverly Hillbillies uh, more than once for sure. So you can kind of start to see what he started with was pretty much there from a body standpoint. And he just modified it so that Jed and Jethro and Granny and Ellie Mae could, could drive that around every week. Um, even this one seemed to be a little bit of controversy when I tried to find out where this one is. There's a bit of a controversy out there online that maybe this really started out as a 1924 REO truck. So again, you never, you never know for sure. I had a trouble finding this one too, although it seems to be um, owned by a guy in New Jersey that rescued it out of a salvage yard. It did seem documented that it went from California to New Jersey and got salvaged at some point. And then this guy found it several years ago and restored it back to look mostly like this, although not exactly like this. So again, one of the tricks of uh, where exactly are those movie cars? It's my understanding that there was only one of these built for the TV series. So that, that part doesn't seem to be in dispute. Okay, next one. This one's a bit of a trick question. 1926 Ford Model T Touring is what Barris started with. Guesses on what that one became. The Munsters coach, exactly. Although what he really started with was three Model T Tourings because this thing ended up being 18 feet long by the time he put them all together. The frame itself was 133 inches long. Um, they spent over 500 hours um, hand making a lot of those body panels. Um, as you can see here, black pearl paint, some of the things that uh, were customized on it, um, the, the headlamps, uh, the pipes, the engines, the, the hearse body modified that's on the back of it. You can see, I think this is a good picture here too because you can see Herman Munster standing up there. And when I dressed up as him, I actually had four inch platforms on my feet to make me a little bit taller, similar to what he did. And if you ever watch this TV series, when Herman drove the car, they took the seat out because otherwise he stuck up too high, clear over the windshield. So he actually sat on the floor when he was shot driving this particular car around uh, because otherwise he was just too, too tall for it. Was a very, it was a workable running car. Um, originally had a 289 Ford V8 in it that uh, came out of a 64 and a half Mustang. Um, high compression pistons, uh, chrome plated carburetors, Insky cam, uh, Bobby Bar racing headers, three speed manual transmission. So it was made to be a driver, um, as were most of the Barris cars. They were real drivers. They weren't just something that was show um, going down the road. I think I've got a picture here too that also shows the original coach with the Dragula car that we'll talk about here in a minute. I put the Munster characters in these photos because these are two cars that there are a lot of knockoffs out there. There are a lot of replica cars. And so this was the only way that I was really sure that these were the original cars was I put the original actors in the shots um, with them. Okay, movie time again. 1979 Ford Town and Country Squire LTD station wagon. Did, I did not even know this one before I started researching it, right? So this is from National Lampoon's Vacation. 
becomes the Wagon Queen family truckster. And if you know that movie, that car ends up looking very differently by the end of the movie because of a, a lot of things that happened to poor Chevy Chase uh, along the way. But it indicates to me that Barris really, I mean, he stuck around a long time, 1979. Um, he was still modifying cars for movies and, and for TV. So a very long uh, career of doing this. All right, this gets even a little more obscure. Hey, Aiden, I'm coming up. Aiden, I'm coming up on the slide that's going to have a little video or a little audio with it. So a six-wheel Amphicat. This one's a little more obscure, but if you spent way too much time watching Saturday morning cartoons, you might remember the banana splits. No? <laughs> Was I the only guy watching the banana splits? Oh, Sherry, thank you, Sherry. I should have known I could rely on her. So the other thing that Barris did, again, this is the 1960s, was he had collaborations with several guys that were doing a lot of Saturday morning stuff. Hanna-Barbera and the shows that they did. Um, Sid and Marty Croft were also um, doing uh, multiple Saturday morning shows. These guys were obviously live characters and uh, he built these little uh, cars that they move around in. Now this may be too loud if Aiden doesn't get it going back, but maybe this will bring back some memories. It did for me. Sing along, Sherry. <laughs> so that's, that's the banana splits. Another live action series that he did, and this was I think Sid and Marty Croft, yeah, called The Bugaloos. Again, this British rock group. Think about what else was happening in the 1960s on TV. Who else was the, the rock group that had a Saturday morning show? The Monkees. Sometimes George Barris gets credited with doing the Monkey Mobile. Did not build that particular one. He owned the original for many years, and people that went to his shop and museum out in California could see that original Monkey Mobile car. Um, but I think that was made by Jeffries. I think that was made by Jeffries. Um, so some people think that Barris did that one, but uh, actually did not. A few other things that he did. This one's more familiar to people from the 1990s. The Kit Car, the Knight Rider, uh, with the talking voice and David Hasselhoff. Um, he didn't do the original design, but he came back on some of the refreshes later in the series. So one more indication that he was keeping his hands in the business for quite some time. Not a heavily modified Firebird, the front clip a little bit and it had that Cyclops red eye that went back and forth and uh, had the, the voice of uh, Daniels in it, but they meant the interior was modified pretty heavily. Not exactly sure what parts George did, but he had a hand in that one. Some cars from the uh, from 60s and 70s series, again, just kind of shows the diversity of his work. TV show called Mannix. Mannix was a private investigator. He modified this 1967 Toronado Roadster for Mannix. Um, and also, a very briefly, a 1968 Dodge Jar GTS that showed up in just a very few episodes. Um, but the Toronado Roadster was uh, pretty heavily modified. He redid the whole front end. He did the back end on it. He put a custom paint job. You can't really see here all that well, but the hood is also heavily customized. Although here was, here's one of my favorite parts of the customization of this 67 Toronado Roadster. 1967. He's got his own telephone right there between the seats. Now don't ask me how he was supposed to dial that thing while he was driving. But uh, yeah, I thought that's, that's pretty unique. Your 1967 technology, you just put a phone between the seats. And you can also see here that he, he modified the seats. So he wasn't just an exterior guy, he was also interior. Um, ventilated the seats as well. So here's, here's one last early TV one for you. Anybody remember this show, My Mother the Car? Uh, Dick Van Dyke's brother, Jerry Van Dyke starred as a guy who bought his car and his mother is possessed in the car. The car is possessed by his mother. Um, 1928 Porter. Uh, Barris did this car, although it's not heavily modified. What it was modified to do was to be driven from the, from the back seat underneath the seats because the car would drive itself quite frequently. And so 
he modified it so you could rear, you know, drive it from the rear seat without everybody seeing me and seeing. Varus also did some things with celebrities. Um, he did a number of golf carts. Here's Bob Hopes. He did one for Bing Crosby. He did one for Elton John. Um, he modified a lot of cars for, for stars. Um, John Wayne, Anne Margaret, um, did a car for Elvis, Shah Zha Gabor. So he was really connected in with a lot of those 60s stars and doing um, some pretty outrageous cars for them. So that takes us to what does the collection own that uh, really connects in with Barris? Well, the two that really are the best example are the one that we've got here, uh, the Cher Mustang, and the one that's still out on the floor, the Sunny Mustang. So it's a little unclear exactly how this whole project started, but uh, Doug got these early drawings and some photos I'm gonna show here in a minute that George Barris, uh, along with his wife Shirley, designed these cars for Sonny and Cher. And back in the day, Sonny and Cher were big. Hit songs, they had their own TV show, um, did a lot of commercials. They were extremely popular, big celebrities. So he put together these, his and her Mustangs for, they were uh, 1966, built in San Jose, California. They are one serial number off from each other, so they're very close coming off the line. Started their life as just your basic convertible, um, three-speed manual, it's, yeah, no, automatic, three-speed automatic uh, transmissions on the floor, no AC, um, they both have the 289 V8 in them, although Sonny's is a four barrel, so he gets a few more horsepower out of that. Uh, Shares was a two barrel, so I think it's uh, 225 versus 200 horsepower between the two with the carburation on them. But pretty much blank slates for Barris to take and do what he wanted to do with them. He had Sonny and Cher involved. Here's a picture of them pretending to change a tire. I seriously doubt if Sonny Bono or Cher ever actually changed a tire um, on their own, but uh, there were some promotional shots of them doing that. There were also shots of them being filmed in the car, so I, I don't know if this was just for the promotional shots. There's a number of pictures that we've got that go with the history of the cars or if they were showing up in other commercials. I couldn't find any references to that, but they, they obviously were in the cars um, and presumably drove the cars um, a little bit. Here they were presumably uh, shot in front of their house in California. The things that you can see on the cars are fairly typical of what Barris would do. He really liked kind of pushing things to the outrageous. And so the pink is definitely a part of that. This is called hot candy pink. And you can see the inserts going down the side are some side of crushed velvet that match up on the inside door panels as well. One reference I found said that those were painted, but they're obviously not, they're a fabric insert. And, and then he reworked the front ends uh, between the two of them to change it around quite a bit. The, the rear lights are also quite heavily modified. The front starts to look a little bit like a Pontiac, especially on Sonny's car that has a little bit more of a beak to it. Um, the rear lights kind of start to look like Thunderbird, but not exactly. So he probably took some cues from other cars that were out there. You'll also notice if you haven't looked at these cars before, definitely after the talk, come up and look at it because it looks like he literally went to the hardware store um, and and bought some kind of egg crate thing. So that has no function whatsoever. It's purely there um, for aesthetics, if you want to think that's aesthetically pleasing. Um, and the front looks like he took the shelf out of his refrigerator and cut it into pieces. That's another thing Barris was kind of known at. Even as a kid, uh, this, there's a story that one time he took the knobs off the kitchen cabinets and customized a card that he was doing. His mother wasn't very happy about that, but he kind of looked at whatever was around and use those to modify the cars. Where these cars are really over the top is on the inside. We'll see on the share car, it's a real fur lined seats with ermine or ermine and the shag carpeting in it, hot pink, very heavy. And the same with Sonny's car, bobcat fur trimmed in black leather. Um, they both came with eight track stereos, which uh, 
that was state of the art, having an eight track stereo. When I listen to some old eight songs that I learned on eight track, I still hear the switch between tracks in my head when I listen to certain songs. So state of the art back then, um, and uh, very popular with what was out there. So these cars are very well documented. They, to the best of my knowledge, are the only two Barris, Sunny, and Cher cars out there. They were not cloned off. He didn't make any more of these. Um, they, they are well documented. They do seem to have gone through maybe a couple of changes. I found several references that the share car actually used to have a set of rally gauges attached to the steering column and, and those are not there anymore. So there may be some changes that happened somewhere along the way. The tires also, excuse me, wheels um, seem to change a little bit. You'll see through some of these shots, they're, they're kind of a wire wheel, especially on Sunny's car. And I think these are the same mags that kind of line up to that one. So there were a few things going through, but these are very well documented cars that the car collection bought from an auction several years ago out in Arizona. So very popular, great examples of what um, Barris was doing for celebrities at the time. There's one more shot. Actually, this is a pretty good one because there's Adam West in the background dressed as Batman. So this was some kind of premiere that Sonny was at, and that's actually George Barris there in the foreground, kneeled down. So yeah, so take a look at those after the talk, if you haven't seen those before, but they're really super interesting. And there's the, the Sonny's car that's still out there. Uh, a couple more cars to talk about in the collection. This is, I gave a little preview of this, the Munsters Dragula. This is the picture of the example that we've got. It's actually in the back right now. It's made a lot of appearances out on the floor. We moved it around. Um, as I said, last Halloween, it was out in the lobby for the month and, and I got to pose with it there. So it'll show up again. It's not currently on the floor, but this is the picture of the car that we've got. It is not an actual Munsters Dragula from the TV show. Um, this is uh, a replica car that was built several years later, and it's similar, but it is different in, in several different ways. The original car, part of the history of it is, uh, at that time, you couldn't legally buy a coffin. You had to get a coffin through, uh, through a mortuary. So the, the legend is that this guy, Corky, Corky Corks, Richard Corky Corks, that worked for Barris, uh, paid some funeral home cash under the table. They conveniently left a casket out back and he went and picked it up under cover of darkness. And that's what actually got turned into the original coffin car or Dragula. Um, again, it was built as a runner. The original car, 350 horsepower using a uh, Ford Mustang V8 uh, 289 with a four speed stick shift, um, two four barrel carburetors, Mickey Thompson manifolds um, and, a, and a lot of modifications on it to basically be a racing car. And again, if you go out there and look, the original Dragula made several runs down the drag track. The storyline is um, Herman bets the family coachmobile in a race and loses it. And so grandpa builds the Dragula to race and win back. So if you, if you pull up on YouTube some of the old TV shows, you can see that car actually running down the drag strip um, with Grandpa or Herman driving it. It also shows up in the movie Munsters Go Home that came out a, a few years later, but it was a legitimate runner. So this, like I said, this particular car is, uh, is kind of a one-off tribute car, if you want to say that we actually own here. It's a little bit shorter. The engine modifications aren't quite the same, um, but it's a nice rep representation and it definitely evokes that Barris design aesthetic that he was really famous for back in the 50s and 60s. And there you can see again the two of them together. The, the last car that we've got to talk about here this morning, um, this one belongs to the collection. It's currently on loan to the garage over in, in Salina, the car museum that opened up um, a while back. We've got it on loan over there with them. It's a nice museum. If you get a chance, go to the Salina and see what they've got. So this car is over there right now. Uh, 
This is called the Cadillac Gargoyle. And actually, um, George Barris kind of built this because he was um, arguing against using a hearse for the Munsters. And so this is kind of how he got an opportunity to do what he wanted to with a hearse. Um, this shows up in a lot of movies also. Um, one called Terror on Wheels. Um, some place I had it. There's several different kind of probably really bad horror movies from the 80s, but it shows up in several different configurations there. This paint job comes from the Motley Crue final tour, All Bad Things Must Come to an End. Um, and this is the way it looks as we own it right now. Several modifications on it. Again, the wheels, spider webs, all matching, um, very customized paint. The engine comes up through the hood. And those were all part of what uh, Barris did to customize this particular car. So we have a lot of fun with this one. It's uh, usually pulled out on Halloween as well. It gains a lot of attention. I know two years ago I was working outside and there was a, a car full of people that literally pulled off the street just to come and look at this car because it was, it was sitting out front. So it gets a lot of attention and we'll probably have it back on the floor um, pretty soon. So that is what I've got to talk about this morning. Um, it's been my pleasure to talk. Like I said, it was a lot of fun. There's so much detail here that I kind of had to chop it down so that we step, kept within uh, the time limits. If there's any questions, I'll do my best to try to answer them. Um, or I can always defer to Doug because he knows a lot more about cars in general. Yeah, question. A couple weeks ago on my classic car, Dennis Gage visited a lady in Colorado who had these exact cars. Oh, really? Now, oh, yeah. I don't know if they were cloned, and I don't know how old that story was, but they were exactly like this. Do you know that was another, uh, was that the original owner? I believe at one time these cars were in a museum in Colorado, Okay. before yes. we bought them. But these are the actual physical cars. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was near Grand Junction. Yeah. Grand Junction. yeah, I think they were there at one time. Yeah. Okay. That was amazing. And did he change his name to Ferris right when he started? Did he keep his private name or was Ferris his profession? From, from what I can see, he changed his name to Barris very early when he opened that custom shop in, in, um, in the LA area when he was right out of high school. I couldn't find any reference, if anybody knows, I couldn't find a reference with how he changed from Salapatis to Barris. Don't know that one. Easier to market. <laughs> Maybe so. That's exactly right, what you said. Just a marketing thing? My wife's Polish and her name was Kristinovich. And when she was... Try writing that in kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> Took three lines on the big sheet. And yeah. did all of it. But the curse was changed to Chris. It was a real simple process. Yeah. And they all did it. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know how he got there. But, you know, I think about, as I was doing this, I kind of thought about, geez, what if George Barris was alive today? Because a lot of these cars, the Cargoyle made it on Monster Garage and some of the other car shows that are out there on TV right now. Um, with all the internet stuff that goes on, I just think how much bigger could he have been today with what social media around cars is versus what he was trying to do in the 50s and 60s. I just one more thing to thank you for. I hadn't thought of Mannix, the show, in, I don't know, 40 years. <laughs> that was a great show. It was a good show. Joe Mannix. Yes. And I made the car. Mike Connors. Yes. Joe Mannix. Yes. There you yes. go. Don't ask me how I knew that, Ann. Boy, I'm impressed. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, thank you again for your time. I'll turn it back over to Doug. He may have some announcements about upcoming talks. Let's give Brian a warm Thank you, Brian. Awesome job. And, uh, I will invite you to come up and check out the share car. We'll pop up the hood and you can check it out closer. And uh, the sunny share car is out on the floor. You can go look at it too. And with that, thank you all for coming and enjoy the museum.